Welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian, and thank you all for logging on. I'm joined tonight by Tim Masso. How'd you guess? And we've got a very eclectic mix of watches. Here we have a 5135 Rose, and not just your typical 5135 Rose. This is a limited edition to 100 pieces for the Russian market, 5135. And what makes this watch so special is the fact that it has a black dial. The watch was actually never produced with a black dial except for this edition. And the watch, which we have on the table here, came with specialized custom cufflinks also. Uh, that came as part of a set. So black cufflinks with the Calatrava cross emblazoned on the front with the black dial. It's an awesome watch. I actually think that the 5135, uh, while not such a huge commercial success when it was launched or when it was being produced, has since come back, you know, to being in much greater demand given that it's, you know, it's, it's a larger watch. And, uh, you know, the rose against the black is absolutely beautiful. It probably should have been made this way back when they were making the watch and uh, overall just a really cool piece. Yeah, every once in a while Patek will do something really cool for the Russian market. They actually made a white gold uh, full blue dial 5960 before the regular production yeah. blue dial 5960 came out and that Moscow edition, it's usually the Moscow boutique, remains a very yeah. highly sought piece. I'll also say this, uh, the 5020 wasn't cool once either because it was rather oddly shaped. Get ahead of the market with stuff like this, this is an opportunity. Yeah, I mean this is an example of a watch, we've actually never seen one. And we had the opportunity to, to purchase it, and you know, I, I said like this is the kind of watch that I think there's a there's still a void in the market in the sense that a lot of consumers don't even know it exists, and you know, it's a good opportunity to buy a truly limited edition watch from Patek Philippe that happens to be one of their most iconic complications at actually a reasonable price point as it stands relative to some of the other. Uh, what the limited editions are doing, and it's a great watch. You know, it's it's a black dial annual calendar. It's a beautiful piece. It's not like it's an ugly edition. No. You know, it happens to be, you know, black dials gorgeous. with rose gold. And it even comes with documentation punchy. saying it's a limited edition. You know, I'm a I'm a big fan of the watch. I'll say this: regional editions and micro editions are like the great next frontier of collectible watches. There have been so many regional boutique special dealers, special occasion editions by great brands. Especially Sincere Watch in the Hourglass out of mm -hmm. East Asia, Chrono Passion and Dubail out of Paris, Siddiqui and Sons. There's been so much cool stuff that's never like been internationally known. Someday, I think there's a great book to be written about regional editions. Yeah. I don't know if I'll write it, but that's a wonderful topic to tackle. So here we have a beautiful Laurent Ferrier Galley Traveler with a cloisonné dial. Actually, Tim is going to talk a little bit more about that it's not just a cloisonné dial. That's correct. This is a remarkably nuanced dial. First of all, there are two Laurent Ferrier enamel dial types on the Traveler. There's the full dial, and then there's the considerably more readable Hour Track White Gold Index, and that's what we have here because you have those white gold indices that actually match the Asagai or Spear style hands. But it is the set of continents and seas at center that really sets this apart. It's a combination of Champlevé in which the dial base is actually engraved out. They actually reduce the dial to create wells that are then filled with enamel, and they also create cloison, basically small cordons using wire made of gold that are then filled with the enamel, the vitreous paint and fired, so you have both additive enamel being executed with cloisonné and reductive, the engraving and filling of wells with champlevé, in order to create the different colorations, different depths of enamel, so more or fewer layers are applied. For instance, you'll note how the blue is not uniform. Some parts are darker, some parts are lighter. That's done with enamel depth. You'll note how the continents are raised, the actual borders of the continents are raised above the seas. That is the cloisonné, the creation of the shapes using the gold wire. Of course, we're also looking at a formidable travel time complication with a number of handsome refinements. You can see how center time is executed by jumping using these Ulysse Norden style hour adjusters. This does not stop the watch or interrupt timing. There is a home time in 24-hour format that scrolls at 9 o'clock, and then there's a date that's keyed to the time at center at 3 o'clock. What's interesting is that you can drive the date using the time zone jumpers, but there's also a quick set through the crown that allows you to adjust it bi-directional. Exceptionally unusual in, in a GMT-style jumper hour hand format. You'll also note that the watch is beautiful on both sides. This is the let me actually grace it with my old school watch you want polishing cloth. But you'll note that this watch features 
what's known as the FBN 230 caliber, and it features a micro rotor automatic system, three day power reserve. To eliminate rattle, you have a jeweled staff with pawls instead of conventional bearings. And then you have a double direct impulse escapement with an overcoil. The result is that you have a chronometer grade timekeeper that realizes the natural escapement principles envisioned by Breguet, but in a wristwatch format, immaculately finished. You see an interior angle around the center wheel, and then you see four interior angles inside the black polished balance cock. This is as good as finish gets, and yes, I am also referring to the work of Patek. Patek, this is the gauntlet thrown down. I'm awaiting a response. So, you know, I think that what I love about this watch is how complicatedly simple it is. And, you know, I love that it features the world time complication, but done in such a simple way where you can very easily move the hour hand forward and backward. You have your home time there presented as an aperture. The date, as you said, can move frontwards and backwards. And the watch was just executed executed extremely well. You've got a gray gold there, which is, so it's a white gold that does not have a rhodium coating on it, so it gives it a sort of darker gray finish. And you know, when talking about the movement, absolutely stunning, and I think that producing a beautiful and amazing simple watch is one of the hardest things to do in watchmaking, and I think that that is something that Laurent Ferrier excels at. I would also say that this Gallet case shape is quickly becoming a recognized standard. It's difficult to, to change something that's fundamentally mm -hmm. based on what's come before. And that's tough to do with bezels, cases, and lugs, but this Galet case form is becoming iconic. Now, I mentioned that there's a quick set for the date, and I want to focus on that. Not only does this watch allow you to quick set the date, despite having a GMT adjuster for the hands at center, it is a bi-directional quick set. So you have a bi-directional quick set for the date, but at the same time, you can drive it using the adjusters and you can drive it in both directions as you traverse the international date line. How cool is that? How many other watches feature both a GMT adjuster system and a bi-directional quick set date? I'm not sure I can name one. So, above all, I think we should start with the watch that represents the oldest on the table, a real veteran, sized and powered per its era. This is the Chichere Le Coult Odysseus Chronograph, a moon phase mecha quartz. This was state of the art at JLC and for the watch industry as a whole in 1988 when these bowed. A combination of features that are so 80s, tritium dial, ivory lacquer, pulsation scale. The chronograph itself is a multi-jewel, watchmaker-serviced, manually lubricated, mechanical, cam-operated chronograph. The base caliber is actually a Jajer Lecoult in-house quartz. You wind up with 25 jewels in total, and a movement that's semi-exotic by current standards. Now, what also makes this a wonderfully 80s piece is that it has two-tone. Where, you ask? Well, if you look closely, it features both rose gold and yellow gold. There's a little gaudron that runs parallel to both sides of the bezel, and it is rose gold alongside yellow. If that seems a little too subtle for you, the gaudron style lugs and bezel more than make up for the lack of color contrast. This watch has a lot of visual punch for something that's 33.5 millimeters. In case you're wondering, it's got that little swimmy fish on the back to remind you that it's water resistant. Check out those pre-1995 hallmarks. I actually like this. Yeah, no, so awesome watch. I think that, you know, what is really telling is you can see that in the late 80s, Jaeger LeCoultre was making a watch that was price point centric in that it was plated. It, you know, had a quartz, quartz, uh, quartz movement mixed with mechanical, but that it wasn't derided at all by the collector community. This was, this was an era where, you know, quartz was actually luxury. Quartz was not just luxury, quartz was actually expected because it would be like saying, I want a carburetor in my car during the 80s. Fuel injection was something that was a big deal back then. They put it on the, they put it on the badges on the car. Quartz was still considered to be high technology during the 80s. And we didn't come out of the funk until really the early 90s when we began to see mechanical as the only path to luxury, which I think is actually misguided, but in terms of popular perception, the upswing for mechanical really wasn't in full progress when that was made in 1988. Uh, tonight I am wearing a Roger Dubuis Sympathy 37. I don't think that I've worn this watch on the show yet, 
but uh, it's a watch that I picked up recently that I had been lusting after for a long time. I finally found one that fit the wrist great. So this is an early Roger Dubuis. I've talked about how much I love them on the show. It's from the mid '90s. It's his perpetual retrograde. It's his perpetual calendar retrograde. So in the 37 millimeter sympathy case. And what I loved about the watch, A, just the shape is unique to the brand. B, once Tim shows you the front of the watch, you'll see that the crystals uh, are actually cut to be the shape of the case, which I just think is absolutely awesome. Uh, you know, the dials are all handmade. I mean, this is when Roger Bui was making some of his finest pieces. This is a gorgeous piece because it's both a French Besançon Observatory chronometer and Geneva Hallmark signed, and the boxed, the boxed set with these things is monstrous. Now, a couple things you'll note about the dial. It is a perpetual calendar with retrograding action. Dubuis was a complication specialist at Patek Philippe prior to his work with the company under his own name. The movement by himself, as well as Agenor's Jean-Marc Viderecht, and it's important to note that the base, which is a Longines L990, is a twin mainspring barrel, ultra-thin auto. And that's not even the most impressive thing about the watch. This particular case shape, though originally claimed by Roger Dubuis co-founder Carlos Diaz, was in fact conceived by a Valley de Joux watchmaker. And the first series, as Brian mentioned, featured the shaped crystal that paralleled the shape of the bezel. Later on, they got sick of making these because sealing it was so labor-intensive. These were objectively just a pain in the butt for them to make. So they went with a round crystal and a shaped case, but with a round bezel and a round crystal, those later watches much less desirable and honestly much less distinctive. Yeah, so I'm just a big fan of the overall look, and I think that, you know, early Roger Dubuis, uh, you know, is a way to get into high complicated watchmaking uh, for really cool watches at a reasonable price right now. That's a fact. They are gaining watches, particularly from that era when Dubuis was technically a company called Sogem from about 1995 to about 1999. Those are the ones you really want, and those are increasingly dear. The, the real bargains are almost gone there. So if you want to get on board, that train is leaving the station. We've got a major complication from a weird independent. This is the MCT Sequential 2 S200 American Eagle Limited Edition. How about white gold? How about blackened? That's like cranking the fireplace in Texas while the air conditions running full blast in August. Yes, it is a white gold watch that has then been blackened. 44.6 millimeters in diameter. You can see this is the MCT S2 caliber micro rotor automatic 40, 40 hour power reserve. This one doesn't excel by virtue of power reserve, but rather by virtue of theater. And I have to say 40 hours is pretty impressive considering what happens with this watch as you work your way through the hours. Now, exactly two hours before the turn, you begin to get a sense of what's going on here as the American flag suddenly becomes blazing at 12. And of course, this is from MCT, the firm founded by Denny Giguet, he of the impossibly complex Harry Winston Opus 11 that if I'm not mistaken, has been rarely delivered and only recently. This works a hell of a lot better, as you can see. Um, perhaps this is the most blatantly patriotic and jingoistic timepiece you can find, but as a one of one, it only needs to find one willing buyer. 44.6 millimeters in diameter with a modular lug design. I'm gonna throw this one on my wrist and give you a sense of how it looks. Yeah, it's a large watch that actually fits reasonably well, and what's you know, what really struck me about this watch, you know, while it definitely is unique and it is a one-of-a-kind piece, is that with, you know, not a huge amount of innovation in the in the space as much as I'd like, it's very cool when you see a, a complication like this come along that's just, you know, very unique and unique to the brand and something that nobody else is doing. Yeah, Chuck Norris, I found your watch. Where are you, man? Give me a call. This is the American Eagle one-of-one one limited edition MCT S200 Sequential 2. This is an absolute riot on your wrist. This thing is a fireworks show by itself, ready for the next 4th of July. Get an early jump. And by the way, how cool is that box section sapphire? That thing must cost a couple of hundred Swiss francs by itself. The boxier the sapphire, the more expensive. And this one, <laughs> I, I, I gotta be honest, this is a completely different sensibility than the Laurent Ferrier independence of the world. 
Yeah. Not it, even close. So let's go with. Let's go from the. Move it quick. The sensational to the sublime. This is a new watch. I thought we were saving this one for last. Uh, we may as well lead with our best. Grubel Forcey GMT Earth. Now the watch is white gold, one of 33 made. This is the newest version of Grubel's GMT. You can see the North Pole, the equator, and the antipode. It's actually a 24-hour display by virtue of a mobile globe with 24 zones. You have a separate world time display just below it to make it easier to read. You've got a 24-second tourbillon angled at 30 degrees because that's how Group will do. You've got a power reserve three days in spite of the relative mass of complications and that hyper 24-second tourbillon, which makes a circuit in 24 seconds. It's literally what it sounds like. You also have a GMT system. It's called the GMT Earth, and with good reason. You have this easy-to-use GMT pusher that allows you to quickly vary the reference time zone. And if you ever have to reason whether you're looking at AM or PM on local, you simply resort to the globe. If you've ever wondered what all that text on the Grubel 4 c is all about, it's not just on the case, it's not just on the dial, it's on the underside of the Doran strap. And by the way, how sporty is that? Natural rubber strap on a Grubel. It's basically a mantra repeating their dedication to traditional craft, arts, fine finishing, and the savoir-faire or the know-how of the past. I saved you a lot of translation and eye strain. Grubel 4C GMT Earth, about $615,000. White gold, about 45 millimeters. So I think that this watch, um has probably become one of the most synonymous watches with the brand. So I think that if you ask a lot of folks that aren't sort of deep in the watch world or understanding, A, most people don't really know what Grubel Force is. Um, but for those that are really just, I guess, wetting their toes within the industry, this is the watch that comes to mind for most people. And as far as wearability goes, I know, um, JBO Surf, you mentioned that it's not that wearable, but this one surprisingly is because of the shape of the lugs and the fact that the rubber strap is extremely soft, it really sort of bends down. I mean, we'll have Tim yeah. throw it on the wrist right now so you can shot. see. Yeah, do a quick wrist shot. Um, but, you know, obviously the price point is prohibitive for most, but, you know, I think that um, as far as the finishing goes, and specifically for Grubel Forsay, I think that if you ask many watchmakers within the industry, even from the brands like De Bethune and even from the main brands, they would say that Grubel Forse probably has the best finishing within the industry. Certainly the largest amount of it. It's one thing to be the best. It's another thing to execute it on a surface area that has to be considered the equivalent of five or six ordinary movements from Philippe Dufour. Uh, the sheer amount of space and the three dimensions, there's a depth to this movement. The movement is over nine millimeters thick and you can see all of it, including laterally. So it's visible to an extent not possible with a smaller case. People ask, why are they so big? I'm sure there's a bit of ego involved in trying to engage in one-upsmanship with the likes of Richard Mule and whatnot, but realistically, it lets you see of all, basically all for which you've paid. And if a smaller watch would be more discreet, it would also be less visible, including to the owner. And that's sort of the idea with Grubel Forcey. As you can see, even laterally, they've given you the ability to see the equatorial plane of that 360 globe they created. It's a sensational thing, and you don't go to the Louvre expecting to take home a master piece, you expect to see something sensational and singular and rare and take home a memory. And for me, the pleasure has been in experiencing a thing like this, and I'm glad to live in a world where it exists, even if I don't absolutely crave ownership of it. And interestingly enough, from the chat, Fat Sam EIE, I love reading these names, um, so wrote, facing. nicer than a Richard Mill, in my opinion. And you know, that's it's a really interesting point, because I think that as, you know, these super high price point watches become more common, specifically from a brand like a Grubel Forse or a Richard Mill. You know, when you see what Richard Mill produces in that six hundred thousand dollar price point, you know, you might be getting just a watch that generates a crazy name or a single tourbillon or or something along the lines. And I just think that on a comparative basis, again, if, you know, if you 
do look at it comparing the two brands, just how much you get with a Grubel Force relative to a Richard Mill for a similar price point. It's a very impressive company. They're out in Le Chaux de Fond and they have 100 employees to make between 80 and 100 watches. So it's, it's a rather impressive proposition. There are very few companies that have such a high ratio of employees to annual units. And the reason for that is that so much work goes into making that watch and so much of it is done under their single dramatically slanted roof, if you've seen a picture of the building. So I think there's an integrity in what they do. There are some companies that charge ridiculous amount of, amounts of money because they can, and you ask, well, what does it actually take to make that watch? And you can reason out that it takes relatively little. With Grubel Forcey, you don't second guess the time and energy that went into it. The only question really is, do you have the budget and do you have the taste? Because mm -hmm. it is a polarizing look. Yeah.